On today's video, we're going to be doing some science experiments with the three different types of fishing line, and we're going to figure out which one is going to work best for the type of fishing that you do. Hey there outdoor YouTubers, it's Dave Kinetter from Kinetter's Practical Outdoors. And like I said earlier, we're going to talk about fishing line today, okay? We're going to talk about the different types of fishing line, kind of try to figure out which type of fishing line or combinations of fishing lines work best for the fishing that you do, okay? Now, it's kind of the consensus that there's three different types of fishing line, okay? The big three, right? We've got monofilament, We've got floral carbon and we've got braid, okay? And there's pros and cons to each one of those three, okay? And kind of the trick is to kind of know the pros and cons of each one and kind of tailor it to the style of fishing that you do, okay? Not the style of fishing that I do, not the style of fishing that the guy on TV does, but to tailor it to the style of fishing that you do Okay, and that's uh, hopefully going to put a, maybe a few more fish in the boat for you. All right, so let's just go ahead and get started. Pros and cons of the big three. All right, so we'll get started with monofilament first. Now, monofilament is very cheap. It is by far the cheapest out of the three different types of line that we're going to be talking about here today. Okay, so that's good. All right, another good thing is when you buy it in kind of the like, low visibility colors like the low vis green or clear it is pretty uh you know stealthy in the water it is kind of difficult for fish to see it okay so that's another plus you know with monofilament okay um another quality of monofilament is there is a lot of stretch to monofilament okay now that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing and, and, and we'll get more into that uh later on another property that uh, monofilament has is it has a lot of line memory okay and by line memory I mean when you pull the line off the spool it kind of curly cues up and it tries to retain the same shape it had when it was on the spool okay and because of this line memory there's a real proper way to put line on a spinning reel okay I did a video about that the video is called putting line on a spinning reel if you go to my channel Go to the playlist and you can go to the fishing line section and that video will be there okay and like I said because of that uh, substantial line memory there really is a proper way to put monofilament onto a spinning reel it's going to help you out a lot to avoid line twists so if you're interested in that check that out another thing about monofilament is it's not going to be the thinnest diameter line that you're going to go out there and buy per pound test so that's some of the overall basic properties of monofilament. All right, the next uh, type of line we're going to talk about is braid, okay? And I'm going to include fire line into the braid category. Um, for one thing, it, it truly is a braid. The only difference is, I guess it's kind of heat treated and the actual interwoven braids themselves kind of kind of fuse together and it seems like it's just one single strand but it but it's really kind of braids kind of fused down by heat so it truly is a braid and we're gonna we're gonna keep that in the braid classification okay so braid what's the story on braid all right well first of all it's gonna be the most expensive okay out of the three lines uh, out of the big three braid is gonna be the most expensive generally speaking okay the other thing about braid is it has next to no stretch or no stretch okay there might be a slight stretch in some braids but it really has very very low stretch qualities to it okay 
Another thing about braid, it is not clear, okay? It is opaque. Light does not penetrate through braid, okay? Underwater braid is somewhat visible in clear water, okay? It's not super stealthy, okay? So braid can be seen easier by fish. And another thing about braid is per pound test, it is going to be the thinnest diameter line out of the big three. Braided line actually has very little memory, okay? You pull it off the spool and it might be curly cued up a little bit, but if you pull it straight, it kind of stays sort of straight. If you put a bend in it, the bend kind of stays. It's not constantly trying to go back to the same shape it had when it was on the spool. Okay, so what's the story on the fluorocarbon lines? All right, first of all, price-wise, okay? Generally speaking, they're going to be a little bit more expensive than mono, okay? But also, generally speaking, they're going to be a little cheaper than your braids, okay? They're going to fall in the middle there somewhere. All right. Second thing, stretch-wise, again, they're going to kind of fall in the middle again. Um, a lot of guys out there will tell you, oh, I, I like fluorocarbon because it doesn't stretch. Well, fluorocarbon does stretch, okay? Not as much as mono. And, and we're going to kind of prove this out in a, a little science experiment later on in the video. But fluorocarbons don't stretch as much as mono, okay? But they do stretch considerably more than your braids, okay? So that's kind of in the middle also. All right. The one big thing, the one big positive thing that fluorocarbon has going for it is that fluorocarbons are very stealthy. They are very difficult for fish to see in the water, okay? has something to do with the index of refraction, some kind of science thing, all right? And I did do a whole video on this, okay? So if you're a little bit more interested in the science behind why fluorocarbons are so difficult for fish to see in the water, okay? You can check out that video. It's called, Why Can't Fish See Fluorocarbon? If you go to my channel, um, you know, go to my uh, playlists. I have a fishing line playlist and that video is in there. Okay, you can check that out and get kind of the science behind it. I have a special guest that comes on the video and explains the science behind why fish have a hard time seeing fluorocarbon in the water. Okay, and we're gonna kind of prove that out later on in the video with another science experiment, okay? All right. Fluorocarbon is very similar to mono, where it, where it does actually have quite a bit of memory, okay? If you take it, you pull it off the spool, it kind of curly cues up. It tries to go back to the same shape it had when it was on the spool, okay? If you pull it straight, it kind of goes back to that curly cue. If you bend a little 90 in it, it kind of springs back. And it's constantly trying to go back to the same shape it had when it was on the spool. So that's the story with the fluorocarbon. Okay, here's another science experiment, okay? A lot of videos out there, a lot of guys will tell you that uh, monofilament floats, fluorocarbon sinks, and braid is, you know, I, I've heard varying things about braid. Uh, maybe it's somewhere in between, that sort of thing. So let's find out for ourselves, okay? Start off with this Power Pro braid. Now it is a braid, so you, you could actually have like air bubbles entrapped in this, okay? But I let this soak for quite a while and I kind of pushed it around under the water before this experiment. So this piece of braid is wet. So we're just going to set it down in the water. And it certainly does float by just setting it on the top. Now if you push it under the water, it's pretty close to having neutral buoyancy. It does seem to want to rise just a little bit, very slowly. Okay, yeah, I think if you push it down, it kind of does want to rise. All right, so, and like I say, this was this was uh, waterlogged for quite a while before this experiment, this little piece of braid. So I guess my conclusion with the Power Pro is that it sort of kind of floats. Okay, so here's a piece of fire line, all right? Same thing, this piece of fire line, I did get it wet before this experiment. And we'll see if we can get it off our fingers there. Now, it's just kind of sitting on the top right now. All right. And we'll do the same thing. We'll kind of push it subsurface. All right. See what it does. And it's really kind of the same thing. It does seem to slowly rise up. All right. Next up. 
a fluorocarbon, okay? This is going to be kind of difficult to see, but here's our little piece of fluorocarbon, Berkeley Vanish. We're going to set it in the water, okay? And it actually is sitting on top right now, okay? I just put it on the surface, and it is actually sitting on top. Now, I'll give that a little push down, okay? And now that does sink like a rock. Okay, that went all the way to the bottom. i got to go down to the bottom to fish that out. And we'll try to do that again. Just set it down. And it is floating right now. It is on the top. But when I push it subsurface, okay, when I get it completely subsurface, vunk, it does sink to the bottom like a rock. Okay, I'll pull that out of there. Okay. So, I guess that's fairly true about fluorocarbon. It really does sink, especially when you get it subsurface. Okay, so let's go to the mono, right? Everybody's telling us that mono floats. All right, so we'll take the, this is a piece of original strand. I'm going to set that on top. Okay, and lo and behold, it does float when we set it, sub, when we set it on the surface. Now, if we push that subsurface, it goes right to the bottom also. Okay very similar to the fluorocarbon all right so to me yeah it just it, it sinks okay i would not describe this particular mono this stren original i would not describe that as something that floats now when it's on the surface it does float but as soon as you push it down below the surface it sinks which is really no different than the floral carbon. All right, next up, we got ourselves a piece of uh, trilene monofilament. Okay, stick that in the water, and that does float. Okay, when it's on the surface, it floats. I'll push it subsurface, get the whole thing below, and it sinks too. All right, so. That's two pretty popular brands of monofilament that actually do sink. Okay, so what did we learn from this experiment? All right, well, first thing I learned is that monofilaments actually do sink. At least the two brands that we just tried in this experiment, okay, the trilene and the stren. Okay, now, uh, if the line is resting on the surface, it does kind of stay on the surface, okay? So I can see where maybe somebody mistakenly thinks that monofilament actually floats. But if you push it subsurface, like we did in the experiment, it sinks. At least these two brands do. Okay? And it's the same thing with the fluorocarbon, with the Berkeley Vanish. You can actually, when you rest it on the surface, it'll stay there, but you push it subsurface, and it sinks. And the fluorocarbon in this experiment actually did sink quite a bit faster than the mono. All right? Um, the only lines that showed any traits of buoyancy were the braids, the Power Pro and the Fire Line. So if you're looking for some kind of buoyancy uh, with your fishing line, um, those would be two options, the Power Pro or the Fire Line. Okay? Now, listen, I don't want to make any kind of blanket statements and say that all monofilaments actually do sink, okay, and all braids actually do have some buoyancy, okay? Uh, I guess what this maybe shows is you might need to go out and experiment with the lines that you use. You know, do the same kind of little experiment and find out. If it really matters to you whether the line sinks or floats, give your lines a test and find out for yourself. All right. Well, here's one of our little science experiments. We've got this piece of duct tape with a few pieces of fishing line uh, taped to it. Got mono, fluorocarbon, braid. All right. And we got the brands in the background, prospectively. We've got the Trilene Mono, we've got the uh, Berkeley Vanish Fluorocarbon, and we've got the Power Pro Braid. Okay. And just to make a note, the the Mono is actually in the clear. Okay. It's not it's not colored. It's not light green or low vis green. It's actually the clear. Okay. And I think you'll be able to see when you stick these down in the water. Okay. The braid really stands out a lot, right? The braid uh, is very visible in this uh, clear water. And the mono, uh, you, you can kind of see that mono too, even though it's in the, in the clear type. But that floral, the one in the middle, that just seems to disappear when you stick it down in the water. 
you know, and that's that uh, index of refraction, right? The index of refraction for fluorocarbon uh, is is very close to the same as the index of refraction of water. That's the way it was explained to me uh, by my buddy. So, anyways, like I said, you can see fluorocarbon really is a pretty stealthy approach, especially in clear water. Okay, so what did we learn from that experiment? Okay, first of all, the braid. Braid was fairly easy to see under the water. Monofilament, okay. We, uh, you know, we used the clear monofilament. We didn't use a colored monofilament. We actually used the clear, but you can still kind of see it under the water, okay. You know, I mean, it's pretty stealthy, you know. It, it's, it's a good option when you're looking for stealth, okay. But it is not as stealthy as the fluorocarbon, right. That fluorocarbon really seemed to disappear under the water. If you're really looking for that uh, invisibility or that stealthiness, probably a fluorocarbon is your best option. All right, guys, let's do a science experiment to see how much stretch there is in the three different types of line, okay? So right over here, we've got our braid, we've got a mono, and we've got a fluorocarbon, okay? And I've got a piece of each tied to the uh, to this screw eye on top of each one. Okay, so we'll start off with the braid, okay? We've got some spider wire braid here, all right? I've got a, a small length cut off, and I've just got a nut tied to the end of it, okay? So we can uh, just kind of grab onto something here. And we'll pull it just till it's tight, okay? Just so there's no slack line in it. And then we'll pull it some more. And it really does not stretch. Okay, so I'd say it's pretty safe to say that at least this spider wire braid really does not have much stretch. So let's go to this next one. We'll go to the fluorocarbon, okay? All right, this is 100% fluorocarbon. Again, we've got a small length cut out. Got a little nut tied to the end of it, okay? And we'll pull it just till it uh, has no sags in it, okay, just so there's no slack in it, and then we'll pull it some more, okay, right there, just like that. That's about the same amount of pressure that I was uh, applying to the braid too, okay, and I think you can see there is maybe an inch of stretch just in this short length, so there is some stretch to this particular fluorocarbon, okay. All right, I think you can see it, maybe about an inch. Of course, this is a very short length of line, all right? So you're going to have more stretch if you've got like a cast distance out, all right? So anyways, that's the fluorocarbon, okay? Now, I know a lot of people will tell you there is no stretch to fluorocarbon. Well, I think you can see from that, there is. All right, next up, the mono, okay? Got a piece of... Uh, Trilene XL 10 pound test. All right, we'll just kind of pull that till there's no slack in the line. And then, whoa, we could pull another couple inches out of that. Okay, well, what did we learn from that? All right, first thing we learned braid, no stretch or nearly no stretch. Okay, second thing we learned fluorocarbon does have some stretch to it. Okay. Some guys say that it doesn't have any stretch. Well, we learned from this little experiment, there is some stretch to fluorocarbon. Third thing we learned, monofilament does have quite a bit of stretch to it, okay? A couple of inches over just this short little length of line. You can imagine, you know, if you have a full cast length of monofilament out there, uh, it's going to stretch even more. So monofilament does have quite a bit of stretch. Fluorocarbon, little bit of stretch. Braid, nearly no stretch at all. It's going to vary between the different uh, brands and the different styles and the different pound tests, you know, that sort of thing too. Okay, so what does this all mean? You know, what, what do all these science experiments really mean? Okay, well, I guess it just means that you want to try and match up the type of line you're using to the type of fishing that you're doing. Okay, and you know, I certainly do not have the knowledge to address every fishing scenario for every species of fish, for every condition, you know. You guys know that. But what I can tell you is the type of fishing that I like to do and the type of fishing line that I like to use when I'm doing it. Okay, for me, I like to do a lot of bobber fishing, okay? 
and I really do like to use braid for bobber fishing. Now don't get me wrong, monofilament, uh, a straight monofilament is a perfectly good option for bobber fishing. Straight fluorocarbon, perfectly good option for bobber fishing, okay? But I like to use braid. I like the, uh, the low diameter for the casts, that can be handy. But I really like the non-stretch for the hook sets, okay? And if you think about it, when you're bobber fishing, the line leaves the tip of your pole, it goes out to the bobber, and then it goes down. Okay, so you don't have a direct path from the tip of the pole to the bait hanging below your bobber. Okay, so you've got to kind of pick up essentially that slack line with the hook set. Okay, and if you're using mono with a lot of stretch to it, that just adds more kind of slack or stretch that you've got to pick up with the hook sets. Okay, so it, it, to me it's kind of important with bobber fishing. You know, especially slip bobber fishing. Because now you could be going from the tip of your pole out to the bobber, and then instead of just maybe going three feet down, you might be going 20 feet down, okay? So that even presents more of that kind of that slack, you know, non-direct path that needs to be picked up with the hook set. And if you were using a straight mono, it would add even more stretch, right? Okay. And now don't get me wrong, I really still want that stealthiness that a monofilament can kind of give you near the hook and even more so the stealthiness that the fluorocarbon gives you near the hook. So what I do is I do go with a braid for my main line but then I go with a fluorocarbon leader down by the hook. Okay, This, this is one of my favorite setups, uh, this slip bobber setup for walleye fishing. I really do like the fluorocarbon leader at the end. Okay. So, you kind of get the best of both worlds there. All right. Now, another pretty common technique for fishing that, that I like to use a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do, is just casting lures. Okay? Spinner baits, crank baits, stick baits, that sort of thing. Just casting lures. Okay? And, you know, in that situation, I really like the braid again. Okay? And I still go with the fluorocarbon leader, though. Okay? Again, I like the casting distances. I like the uh, non-stretch for the hook sets, and then that fluorocarbon leader, that comes into play. I got that stealthiness in and around the bait. Okay. Another uh, fishing technique that I use quite a bit is jigging. Okay. And a lot of times I'm jigging for walleyes, you know, but uh, some of the same principles will apply jigging for anything. Okay. And again, I like the braid as a main line, and I like the fluorocarbon as a leader. Okay. Now the braid, when I'm jigging, it's not so much about casting distance, okay? It's more about having a feel for the bottom. A lot of times I'm hopping or jigging that jig along the bottom. And I can really get a feel for what's going on on the bottom, whether I'm in mud, rocks, if I'm bumping up against weeds, that sort of thing. The non-stretch braids really transmit those different vibrations from that jig down in the water through the line into your hand a lot better than the stretchy monos do. So when I'm jig fishing, I really do like to have a braid as my main line. And again, fluorocarbon leader. Now, if you've never used braid, uh, let's say that you've always used mono, okay, and you're thinking about maybe switching over and trying some braid, see how it works out for you, okay. A few things I'm just going to mention real quick, okay, because I don't want you to have any surprises uh, if you're going to braid for the first time, okay. There's a, there's a few unique things about braid, okay. First of all, some of the same knots that worked with your monofilament won't work with braid. They'll, they'll slip right out when you put pressure on them when you tie them up with a braid. Okay, So you might want to just examine the type of knots you're using. Another thing that you'll notice with braid when you're fighting fish okay, is if you're used to using mono, you've kind of got that built-in shock absorption from the stretch of the mono. Okay, Especially when you're fighting fish kind of closer to the boat. Okay, so you may have to alter some of your fish fighting techniques, okay? Like I said, uh, that mono really can uh, absorb some of those head shakes or some of those power runs that a fish might do on you, okay? So now when you're using braid, there's no stretch, okay? You've got to rely on the bend of your pole, you've got to rely on your drag, you've got to rely on maybe even back reeling a little bit, maybe just giving the fish line just with, with extending your arms, that sort of thing. Um, you might want to be prepared to incorporate some of that stuff uh, into your fish fighting techniques because you no longer have that good shock absorption that uh, monofilament gives you. 
Another kind of unique thing about braid, if you tie the braid directly to the spool of your reel and then just kind of uh, wind it on, okay, and you don't use tape or anything like that, sometimes that bulk of braid on the spool can actually spin independently. The whole bulk of it can spin independently of the spool. Okay, because you don't have that, that stretch that mono has. When you put mono on a reel, it kind of grips around that spool and holds its place. Braid won't do that because it doesn't stretch. It really doesn't grip. But what a lot of guys do to combat this is they'll tie the braid around the spool and then they'll put a piece of tape over it and then wind it on. And a lot of times that'll hold it just perfectly fine. Or, like for me personally, I'm almost always using a monofilament backer and then I'm putting braid on after that, okay? I very seldom fill up an entire spool with all braid. It's just kind of pricey and expensive to do it that way, so I don't, okay? So just having that monofilament backer will grip onto the spool and not let the whole bulk of it spin independently from the spool itself, okay? And then, you know, another thing that was done is some spools started adding this little recessed uh, eye hole there that you're actually supposed to tie to, okay? And I think a lot of the manufacturers started doing that um, back when the, the super lines and the braids started getting popular because people were experiencing the whole bulk of it just spinning on the spool, okay? So your spools may have this, uh, this little tie point, and of course then it's not going to spin independently on the spool either. But I just wanted to mention those few things uh, so you uh, lifelong mono guys won't have those be surprises for you if you're going to go out and try some braid. Okay, so I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, oh yeah, we get it. This guy uses a braid for his main line with a fluorocarbon leader, and that's how he pretty much fishes for everything. Okay, well, that's not quite true. Okay, I do use braid with a fluorocarbon leader for most things, but there's a couple scenarios that I don't use it. There's a couple scenarios that I really do like to use a straight monofilament as my main line. Okay, I'll kind of explain that to you. So one of the scenarios where I like to actually use a straight monofilament as my main line is uh, when I'm trolling for walleyes. Okay, and a lot of times when I'm trolling for walleyes I'm using a crawler harness, right, a, a spinner and a crawler, or a lot of times I will fish with a small flatfish with a crawler off the back of that. Okay. And, and both those uh, trolling techniques are kind of quasi sort of finesse techniques, okay, because you're trolling really slow, and then you've also got that live night crawler off the back, and, and that kind of helps to entice sort of neutral fish, okay. Um, like I say, a lot of times when you're out fishing, you're dealing with neutral fish, right? That's just how fishing is. Now, if fish are just flying out of nowhere and hitting anything, some of this won't matter as much. If you've ever watched any kind of underwater camera footage of walleyes like following a crawler harness, um, they kind of will come up behind it sometimes and they're just following it and, and they're maybe just kind of nipping at it a little bit and, and they're not really coming up and trying to engulf the whole thing, okay? And if you'll notice, sometimes they're, they're nipping at it and sometimes they're even flaring their gills, okay? And I believe what they're trying to do, they're actually trying to suck that bait into their mouth. Okay, and if you think about it, that's probably a pretty common thing for them to do with a lot of the things that they eat out in nature, right? Walleye swims up to a leech, just kind of flares his gills and sucks it in, okay? Wiggler is probably the same thing. Even small minnows, I'm sure at times, walleye can just come up behind them and kind of flare their gills and the bait gets sucked into their mouth. Well, if you think about it, if you've got that crawler harness, if you've got that, you know, like I say, I like to use flatfish sometimes with a crawler, and they're a little tentative, and they're maybe just kind of nibbling at it, you know, and they're maybe trying to suck it in, well, if that's attached to a non-stretch line that goes up to your fishing pole, and you've got kind of a relatively stiff pole, that walleye cannot suck anything back, you know what I mean? Even if it's kind of nipping at the tail and pulling, it, it, it won't come back to it, it can't really pull back. Sometimes they swim up, they grab just the tip back end of the night crawler and they're kind of swimming with it almost like they're they're trying to kind of feed it back into their mouth okay and like I say if you've got a no stretch and you've got a fairly stiff pull that that lure that crawler harness that flatfish with the crawler there's gonna be no give to it it's not gonna come back to that fish okay 
So that's where I really do like to have mono. So I've got that good stretch. And I also will go with a fairly soft tipped rod. Okay, so now walleye kind of goes up there and just kind of starts grabbing the back end of that crawler. It actually can make that, that whole rig kind of hesitate a little bit and let them get up on it. Or I think even sometimes if they're just trying to suck it in with their gills, you know, I think it can kind of hesitate and maybe come back. And I think sometimes you get a few more hook sets because of that. So anyways, that's one instance where I do like to go with a straight mono. Okay guys, now before we wrap things up, uh, I wanted to let you know about an exciting new product that's going to be sold at Camaro's Crawlers. Okay, um, you, guys, uh, you guys have heard me talk about Camaro's Crawlers before, right? Uh, Camaro's Crawlers is my one and only sponsor. Okay, my buddy Ronnie Camaro, we went to high school together. He, uh, he runs a small bait shop out of his parents' house where he lives, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we call him Ronnie Camaro because he only drives Camaros, right? He's got a summer and a winter Camaro. You know, it's, it's kind of his thing. But anyways, some of you that have watched my other videos have heard me talk about Camaro's Crawlers before. Well, Camaro's Crawlers has uh, an exciting new product, and it, and it matches up well with this video, because uh, the product that he's selling is a new type of braided line. And, you know, again, if you watch some of the other videos, uh, you've seen where, where Ronnie will give me kind of a sheet of paper, and I kind of read it like kind of a commercial um, for whatever's going on on his bait shop. And... Uh, this video is no different. He gave me the sheet of paper. All right. Okay. Yeah, just whatever. He just kind of writes it on this piece of paper. Anyways. Okay. All right. Um, Camaro's Crawlers is the proud new sponsor of a new braided fishing line. Okay. This isn't just any braided fishing line. Okay. Um, this new braid is called Hemp Pro. Okay. All right. It's 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 made from hemp okay it's, it's not power pro it's hemp pro and it is made from hemp and you know if you look back in history um, hemp was used as a material for making rope okay it was a it, hemp really made some strong rope you know if you look back in history but um, you know over time uh, hemp developed other uses and they kinda didn't use it for rope so much okay all right Okay, so, yeah, until recently, Hemp Pro uh, braided fishing line was only available on the black market, all right? But um, Ronnie says here how certain state laws have changed, and now Hemp Pro braided line is available, but for recreational use only, okay? Uh, and I think what that means is uh, you can't use it for, like, fishing in tournaments. You know, you can only use it for like recreational fishing, all right? So, so keep that in mind, you tournament fishermen, you, you can't use uh, Hemp Pro uh, braided fishing line for tournaments, okay. Yeah, and I know Ronnie is really excited to be one of the first distributors of uh, Hemp Pro braided line up here in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and he was able to get in on the ground floor because of a previous job he had, he already had all the proper licensing, okay? A lot of the uh, the bigger outdoor stores, they're still going through red tape trying to get their proper licensing to sell uh, Hemp Pro braided line. So uh, Ronnie's kind of got the jump on him, you know, as far as that goes. So I know he's pretty excited about that. So if you're looking to try a, a new braid that I think is going to be really, really strong, head on down to Camaro's Crawlers and pick up some Hemp Pro braided fishing line. Okay? All right. Very good. So we got that out of the way. And hey, guys, so what did we learn, okay? We learned about the three different types of line. We talked about some different fishing scenarios, maybe to try to match up some of the fishing scenarios that you have with the different characteristics of the line, maybe put a few more fish in the boat. And we also learned that uh, Camaro's Crawlers is selling a, uh, a brand new type of braided fishing line called Hemp Pro, okay? So you might want to check that out. And hey, guys, remember to hunt fish. Laugh, repeat. This is Dave Knetter from Knetter's Practical Outdoors. Hey, thanks for watching and God bless.